Welcome friends to another r slash nuclear revenge video. Today we've got a crazy story of getting revenge against a cheating ex and it's written by Kermit the Frog. Fooled my cheating soon to be ex-wife into thinking I was cheating, then thermonuclear shinobi ghosted and served her Christmas day. I hope you've got some time and a snack because this one's going to be super long as the events that follow span from late 2019 to last week. As per the rules, all names are altered herein. Okay, so here's the backstory. My soon-to-be ex-wife was my high school sweetheart. We started dating in 1992 when we were both 17, we're both 45 now, and have been together ever since. She's the only woman I've ever been with my entire life. We married five years later at 22, fresh out of college. A year later, we had our first of two children, both boys, 22 and 17. 23 years I gave to her, built to her house, worked my butt off to give her the life she wanted. Sure, we had rough patches, but what marriage doesn't? Even in the worst of times, we found a way to pull through and come out the other side better, which made the discovery of her affair that much more jarring. Flashback to March 2020, when I first got the feeling something was off. For a good two months prior, we were in a funk. I was on the mend from reconstructive knee surgery, blew out my ACL fall 2019, but still lacking in movement. At the time, I only had about 55% range of motion on my knee. This took quite a toll in the house. I was out on workers' comp as I'd been injured on the job, and I was unable to do my usual household duties, so a lot got backed up. My sons would do what they could, but tasks only I was capable of doing had to be put on the back burner, or my wife had to do, which she wasn't pleased with. Things also crawled to a standstill in the bedroom between us. It had already slowed down prior to my injury, but in the state I was in at the time, it completely stopped. During these months, she, we'll call her Sue, was spending more time hanging with co-workers after work. Between November 2019 to March 2020, it was a regular occurrence for her. Naturally, I thought nothing of it. I've never in the 23 years I'd been with her had any reason to worry or not trust her. She has her friends, I have mine, and we have mutual. I'd go hang out with my friends all the time and there was no issue. It was all above board. It was around January of this year that I noticed something odd. Sue started getting noticeably distant with me. Sure, we were in a funk, but she'd never denied me affection to that point. The usual hugs and kisses she'd gave me came to a halt. Her phone was attached to her hand long before my suspicion grew, but she'd always share and show me things she'd discovered on the web, DIY interests and recipes on Pinterest, memes, all kinds of stuff. But she was now being guarded about her phone. Even her interactions with me became more snippy as if she couldn't be bothered. So we're now in March. COVID has arrived in New York City's lockdown. Our chosen careers fall under the essential designation, so neither of us have to work from home. I'd just been recently cleared to return to work after five months on the shelf, and I was eager to get back after it. As five months on my butt rehabbing my knee and not being able to do physical stuff drove me nuts. For context, I enjoy physical activities. I'm an avid martial artist and I'm typically in the gym four days a week, on top of all the home projects I did. Within a week or two of the lockdown, my soon-to-be ex-wife alerts me that she's going to have to start putting in extra hours again. Again, I think nothing of this because of her field. Of course, I was under the assumption it'd be every other day. But no, it was every day, and not just an hour or two. She'd come home three or more hours later and go straight to the shower, spend a little time with me, a little time with our 17-year-old, 22-year-old lives with his girlfriend cross town, and then go to bed. As I'm able to support myself and my knee better, we started getting intimate again, but as you'd probably guess, she wasn't mentally or emotionally present for it, which I noticed quickly. So by early April, the picture started getting clearer to me. All of the signs were pointing to the idea that she was having an affair. That's when I decided I needed to find answers. So I scoured the internet on things I should be looking for. Signs of infidelity in one's partner. And sure enough, she was pretty much ticking all of the boxes on such behavior. So then my search and query advanced to how do I find proof? I started with her social media, looking at her Facebook entries from months prior. It's pretty much the usual. Pics of us and our sons, pics with her and her friends, and a few more pics of her nights out with co-workers. 
In these pics, it's a mixed bag of her closest friends from work and a couple of folks I've never met from her work. But I see one recurring thing in a number of these pics. One guy. In every picture he's in, he's rather uncomfortably close to her. His arms around her shoulder or hand on her lower back. Way too close for a guy I've never personally met. Needless to say, that put a sour taste in my mouth. But that wasn't the worst of it. No, 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 the worst was the fact that apparently this dude is a friend of hers on Facebook and follows her on Instagram. So we go to look up his Facebook account, and wouldn't you know it, I'm blocked. Why the heck am I blocked from seeing this guy's Facebook account? But he's friends with her on Facebook. Yep, I'm now in Batman detective mode. At that point, I wasn't even trying to deny it. I knew she was cheating on me with this guy. My mission was to find out for how long. And over the course of April and May, that's what I did. You know, I never had any clue the depth of info you could secure from phone, text, and email records up until then. We have a family cell phone package, and I was able to pull up quite a bit of data. My soon-to-be ex-wife's data history was telling. The two most frequent numbers she had interacted with from October 2019 to April 2020 was my own, and a number I've never seen before. Take a wild guess whose number it was. A quick check on Google, and I confirmed it was the dude from the photos who blocked me on Facebook. We'll call him POS because that's what he is. Again, the picture becomes even clearer at this point, but a lot of their messages and texts were disjointed, which meant she was deleting a lot of them. I knew she was cheating on me with this guy, but nothing in the data could serve as a smoking gun. I needed more evidence. It's at this point that I tell my best friend Oz what I'd found. He asked me did I confront her with what I had, and I said no because I felt like it wasn't enough. That's when he told me about an app that I could download to apparently spy on her communications in real time. I won't say the name as I don't know the rules on that here. I got it installed, sync up my data plan, and waited. Within days of doing so, I finally saw it. A text string between the two of them talking about how much fun they'd had the previous night and making plans to do it again that weekend. Boom. Gut punch. To say I was completely devastated was an understatement. I guess that moment counts as my D-Day and for the next two days after, I was just broken. I actively distanced myself from her those two days immediately after D-Day, which she was noticeably shaking by. She'd try to console me and ask me what was wrong, but I'd brush it off and leave her presence. I couldn't even look at her. This woman who I gave 23 years of my life to, who I had given everything I could and more to as a husband, and she stepped outside of our marriage for a guy just 5 years older than our eldest son. By the third day, I wasn't even sad anymore. I was pissed. I contacted my friend Oz to let him know my suspicion was confirmed. And he asked me had I confronted her yet. My answer was no, and I told him I wanted payback. I didn't want to just divorce her. I wanted to destroy her. I wanted to leave her life in shambles and freaking ruin her. It was going to take time to do so, and I devised a plan. In my readings and research on infidelity, I had saw a quote that resonated with me that went, The enemy of infidelity is unpredictability, or something to that ilk. That was going to be the basis of my plan. I was going to make her life hack on wheels while also secretly planning my exit strategy. So we're now in early June, and I've got the app still installed. Pretty much every night, I'm gathering as much data as I can seeing their back and forth messages. They're talking like it's a full-blown relationship they're in. Sexting, lovey-dovey romantic stuff, inappropriate photos, the whole freaking bag. At that point, I'd stopped looking at any of it. I was just collecting info and cataloging on my private FPS server. Meanwhile, I start doing things out of the ordinary. I start going out at odd times. I start coming home later than she does. In her presence, I'm on my phone a lot more than usual and when she asks, what are you up to? I just simply say, just stuff and put my phone away. I'd also changed my login info on everything so she couldn't access any of my stuff. Mind you, for our entire marriage, we'd never hid anything from each other. But right around, I'm assuming the start of her affair, she'd changed her password on Facebook as well as on her phone stating she had to because of the security breaches in recent months. Yeah, really nice cover for hiding your affair from your husband. 
Anyway, I'd clued Oz into my plan, as well as telling my older and only sister and two more of my closest friends what was going on. These are people I trust with my life, and I swore them to secrecy. For context, Oz and I have been friends since we were kids. The other of our friends, Joey and Nina, we've known since high school. Make note of Nina, she comes into play down the road. July comes, and my soon-to-be ex-wife is in full paranoia mode. She's texting and calling me a lot more frequently now, asking me if I'm going to be home when she gets home, when am I coming home while she is and I'm not, asking me what I'm up to, the works. I can see the seed planted in her head the month prior is starting to sprout, especially in her communication with POS. She's confiding in him her doubt and confusion, telling him that I'm getting cold and distant. The freaking nerve of this woman. In the interim of these interactions with POS, she suggests that maybe they should stop meeting up at our house, because she has no idea if I'd just show up, confirming that yes, she's had this jerkwad in my home. Thanks, Sue. POS asks her in that specific communication was she worried about me potentially cheating on her, which actually pissed her off. I can't even begin to describe the level of joy and how many laughs I got out of reading that exchange. My cheating wife arguing with her affair partner over if she's mad her husband could be cheating on her. Oh, the freaking irony. Now bear in mind, I'm not hooking up with anyone. When I leave, I'm usually at Oz or Joey's throwing back some booze, watching fights and spending some time with my bros, or at my big sis's house hanging with her and my brother-in-law, who's like an older brother to me. My sis is 52 and her hubby's 58. She had told him about my soon-to-be ex-wife's infidelity, but not of my plan. Couldn't risk it as he's a bit of a blabbermouth. We'll fast forward now to October. That's when things seriously pick up. I've been in my faux affair for three months now, and Sue is hyper aware of the fact that I'm actively pulling away from her. It's been as long as the day I enacted my plan until the day she confronted me, October 20th, 2020, that I'd even touched her. No hugs, no kisses, no initiation of intimacy, nothing. Not like she needed it, she was still screwing POS just at his place or at motels. So that afternoon she calls me at work, which wasn't rare before this all began, but certainly hadn't happened in a while, and asks me to come straight home after work, saying she had something important to tell me. I'm not gonna lie to you all, I half believe she was going to come clean about her infidelity, but she of course didn't. Instead, I get home to her asking me if I was unhappy with her. The freaking nerve. She cites the fact that I've been spending way too much time away from home, I don't show her affection anymore, and our sex life has completely died. She tells me she's worried I'm pushing her away because I was resentful of how she treated me the months I was rehabbing my knee. And then came the punchline. She freaking asked if I was cheating on her. Folks, I fell on the floor laughing hysterically. And when I say hysterically, I mean Joker laughing gas hysterical. On the surface, it looked like, to her assuming, it was me laughing off the notion of being unfaithful. But it was of course actually me laughing at the sheer irony of what was happening in front of my eyes. I'm tearing up, pounding on the floor in complete hysterics for a good two minutes before I compose myself enough to answer. I sit up and look her in the eyes for the first time in months, shaking my head, but I don't give her an answer. I stand up, brush myself off, kiss the top of her head, and go about settling in for the night. Later that night, as I'm in my office, I decide, you know what, given the brevity of what happened, I wanted to see what she was telling him. So I fire up the app, and sure enough, they're actually texting in real time. She tells POS, I know he's cheating on me. I asked him tonight and he literally laughed in my face. He fell on the floor and laughed for like five minutes. It wasn't five minutes, obviously. He doesn't care how I feel anymore. I don't know how or why, but he's gone. I know I've lost him. This is karma, I know it. The smile on my face I had while reading that must have resembled a Cheshire cat. She was breaking. POS attempted to console her, saying that if I cared enough for her, she wouldn't have had to come to him to give her what I wasn't giving her. But the tone of her responses told me she was having doubt now. She had the nerve to step out of our marriage because I was unable to fulfill my role as a husband due to a legitimate injury and kept the affair going for at that point nearly an entire year. But the idea of her losing me to another woman was enough to make her waver? What a freaking weakling. 
Now during all of this, I was also exacting the second part of my plan for payback, getting all of my affairs in order financially. In September, I had met with a family attorney to get the ball rolling on divorce papers with the mountain of evidence I'd piled up to that point. New York is an at-fault state as far as divorce, and the overwhelming amount of proof I'd gathered displaying Sue's infidelity pretty much solidified I could nail her to the freaking wall in a divorce case. My lawyer instructed me to get all of my financials in order in preparation for whatever division of assets might come as a result. I went one better than that, secretly pulling all of my money out of our joint account and putting it in my personal account. I also started shopping around for an apartment as part of phase two. We're now in November and I've not changed my behavior. In fact, I've ramped it up. This is where my friend Nina comes into play. For context, Nina and Sue have never been what you call close. I met Nina freshman year of high school two years before I met Sue. Even way back then, Sue had seen Nina as a threat, as she's my closest female friend. There's always been an implied, I don't trust her from Sue regarding Nina. She's never addressed it directly, but it's obvious to anyone who pays attention. Conversely, Nina's never been a big fan of Sue. Early in me and Sue's relationship, Nina called to attention to me how Sue was pretty much imposing herself into our little square of friends. Whereas I didn't do the same with Sue's set of friends. That irked Nina because she knew why Sue was doing it. Her. Among Sue's circle even now, there are no male friends. Aside from POS. Whereas Nina is the only girl in my square. Nina had been stuck overseas due to the virus and finally returned to New York City November 3rd. Oz, Joey, and I decided we were going to celebrate her return with a night at Joey's house for dinner and drinks. There was only five of us, Oz, Joey, Joey's wife, who is also Nina's sister, Nina, and myself. Sticking to CDC guidelines, we take the Rona very seriously. Nina, being the evil mastermind she is, comes up with an evil idea to trigger Sue. She suggested we take some photos in the same vein of photos I discovered of Sue and POS months prior and post them to my Facebook. And that's just what we did. It wasn't until the 5th that Sue got wind of it, as I'm guessing a few friends noticed my updates and saw how uncomfortably close I was with Nina. This really messed her mind up, because she still believed I was cheating, and I can almost guarantee she wanted to accuse Nina, but she knew that Nina had been stuck in Europe for the majority of the year. Still didn't stop her from attempting to dress me down that night for being so as, she said, handsy in the pics. I saw this as a golden opportunity to deliver the lead jab for my knockout blow. I say, so what about the pics with you and POS from last year? He was pretty handsy in them, but did you see me get bent out of shape over it? Deer and the headlights. It was the first time I even mentioned the dude's name throughout all of this. The hamster wheel in her head started reeling in real time as she tried to explain away those pics. To that point, she hadn't even known I saw them. That's how little I use Facebook. When I actually do post something, it's like an event to people, which is why the pics with Nina specifically got so much traction among our circles. And explain away she did. He's that way with everyone, he's just a really friendly guy. I can see how it looks, but there's nothing there. I'm sorry if those pics hurt you, I'll delete them. No, no, the pics aren't what hurts me. The year you've been hooking up with the dude whilst lying to me that you're working extra hours and hanging with friends is what hurts me. But Vengeance, as Lieutenant Commander Worf from Star Trek The Next Generation so famously said, is a dish best served cold. From that night, Sue was being extra specially clingy and attentive to me, like annoyingly so. She'd try to initiate affection and intimacy with me, and I'd stonewall her at every chance. All the while, I'm archiving literally everything she says to POS. Mind you, at this point, I'd long since gone numb. Any desire I might have had to save my marriage was dead. I'd checked out the day I enacted the first phase of my plan. She's confiding in him that I've gotten worse, that she doesn't know what to do, and she feels like I absolutely hate her. I do. Then comes the bombshell. She says she can't see him anymore, the guilt is too much for her, and she feels like karma is suffocating her. She can't risk losing me. She says that she loves POS deeply, but she still is in love with me, and she has to save her marriage before she loses me. No, my dear, you're about eight months too late for that. POS loses his crap, saying such lovely things as, he doesn't love you the way I love you, and you're making a mistake, you can't just throw me away like this. That text chain would be the last they'd have until about three weeks ago. 
Throughout the remainder of November into December, she's stuck in limbo. She's trying to gauge where my headspace is and is still unable to tell if I'm actually being unfaithful. Meanwhile, POS is steadily blowing her phone up daily, but she's not responding to him. I'd see her check her phone often, then quickly put it away. Meanwhile, phase two of the plan was now officially complete. The divorce papers were done. I found me a studio apartment in Co-op City, New Yorkers will know the area, and signed a two-year lease on it. All of my money was in my personal account. I was ready to throw my haymaker. So we're now at Thanksgiving. My oldest and his girlfriend were hosting a small gathering of our immediate families. So them, oldest and his girlfriend, oldest girlfriend's parents, she's an only child, myself, Sue, and our youngest. We have a great night. My oldest's girlfriend is studying to be a chef, and she did all the cooking herself. The girl can freaking cook, let me tell you. As I had to keep up appearances of nothing being wrong between Sue and I, I initiated affection with her several times that evening. Kisses on the cheek, cute little hugs, wrapping my arms around her shoulders from behind. The gestures didn't go unnoticed by her as she reveled in it. Bear in mind, this was the first time I touched this woman since I kissed the top of her head the night she confronted me in October, so just about two months. Not gonna lie, I felt repulsed doing it, but I had to. I couldn't risk the plan, and me being distant to her in the face of my boys, my oldest's girlfriend, and her parents would set off alarms. So my youngest decides he wants to stay over with his big bro for the night, so Sue and I head home. On the drive home, she thanks me for being so good to her and says, I don't know what you're going through baby, but I'm here for you. I had to hold off busting out a maniacal laughter again and responded saying, I know, I just need time. So for the first time realistically since springtime, we hooked up that night. I figured screw it, with what I'm about to do, may as well get some action before I delete her from my existence. I won't go into detail, but it wasn't love making. When I finished, she was a lump of flesh laying there trying to figure out the direction of the truck that ran her over. No cuddling or anything after. I just got up, showered, and went to go sleep in my office. To her confusion though, I used protection. First time in two darn decades I did. She was definitely perplexed by it, but she didn't ask questions. Sure as heck wasn't going raw knowing that she'd been doing so with POS for months at that point. I wake up the next day and check my handy dandy spy app, and for the first time in weeks, she responded to POS. Dude went full novella. He professed his love for her, said she was wasting her time trying to rekindle a flame in me that died, that she'd been in a prison with me for 23 years and deserved to experience the love and affection of a man that would cherish her. Mind you, this dude is 27 freaking years old, five years older than our oldest son. And he's that sprung on a 45-year-old married mother of two? What a grade A high-quality simp. She chose to blow up our marriage and destroy the home we'd built for this dude? A pretty boy with a soft side? Ah! She responded saying pretty much the same thing she said when they last talked. That she loved them and enjoyed their time together, but she can't lose me. I'm still the love of her life. But she'll always have a place for him in her heart. That they can still be friends if he chooses, but the physical relationship between them is over. He begged her to see him one last time that week and, yep, you guessed it, she said yes. One more for the road, right? Who am I to say anything? That's what I did to her the previous night. Of course, I added all of that to the archive I'd compiled. December 4th is when Phase 3, the final phase of Operation Shinobi Ghost, started. The divorce papers were in hand. My new place or residence was set up. Now I had to slowly start moving my stuff out of the house. But first, I had to break the news to my boys. I called my oldest to the house that Friday night, had them join me in my office, and laid everything on the table. Not the specifics, but that their mother had been cheating on me for over a year, and I was going to be filing for divorce soon. My 17-year-old was especially shaken up by this, because he himself had recently experienced his first taste of infidelity. Yep, his first girlfriend had cheated on him just four months prior. Seeing his heart broken a second time at the idea that his own mother was capable of doing this hit him hard. My oldest took it a lot better and suggested taking his brother in to live with him until this blows over, to which I agreed. We packed up some of his stuff and he asked me if I was going to be okay. I told him, yes son, I'm going to be alright. And so are you. We're going to be alright, I promise. And then they were off. The hardest part was now over, and it was now time to arm the nukes. 
Over the next few weeks, day by day, Oz would help me get a little of my most sensitive stuff out of the house, gave him a list of all the definite stuff to grab while Sue and I were at work, and left him the spare key. This was all stuff that Sue wouldn't notice was missing unless he told her it was gone. I'd also gotten a new phone and a phone number and told everyone who needed to know, Oz, Joey, Nina, my boys, big sis and my mother, my new contact info. Meanwhile, I'm keeping up the ruse with Sue and she's none the wiser, trickling bits and pieces of affection to her just to keep her off the trail, whilst she's still in contact with POS. Not to the extent that they'd been prior, but there's still an emotional thing happening. The fog is faint, but it's still there. All the while, I gather everything, and I do mean everything. Every bit of data I've archived since I started the plan. Call logs, texts, pics, emails, everything, and start making printouts. Folks, I must have spent over $1,500 on staple supplies, printer ink, paper, binders, the works, and I cataloged everything in order from the beginning of the affair until that last bit two weeks ago, December 16th, in the binders. 14 of them. I then put each one in a box and gift wrapped each, addressing them to various people. My mother, my father passed seven years ago, her parents, her two sisters, her brother, her HR department, did I forget to mention POS works for the same company, and there's an expressed rule against intercompany relationships because of the nature of what she does. Several of her friends, POS and POS's parents lugged all those freakers to the post office and shipped them all out December 16th. ETA for the delivery, December 22nd to 24th. Perfect. So we're now at Christmas Eve. Sue comes home around the usual time. No idea if she'd seen POS. I'd stop tracking her on the app the 18th. Figure I'd gotten all the mileage I'd need out of it. As per usual, she showers, hangs out with me a bit, I blow her back out on the living room couch, I know I'm a freaking jerk, and she turns in for the night. The final phase was upon me at long last. The nuke I'd been arming since June was finally about to be launched. In the middle of the night, I woke up and wrapped up one of the three remaining binders with the divorce papers taped to the inside cover and set it on my side of the bed with a note that said, Merry Christmas on it. Next to it, I left my old phone and the business card of my lawyer. I packed up the remainder of my most needed items, enough to fill two backpacks, and I left my home that I spent 23 years in for the last time. That, my friends, was one week ago. To Sue, I'm completely off the grid. Gone. Shadow ghosted. She's blocked on Facebook, but still hasn't blocked me for some reason, so I'm keeping tabs on the fallout. It's absolutely glorious. My packages have reached everyone I sent them out to, and Sue is getting crucified. Her youngest sister completely dressed her down. Both of her parents have condemned her. My mom absolutely destroyed her. Like, holy crap, I know my mom has a mean streak, but the things she called Sue were unfreaking holy She's been frantically trying to find out if anyone knows where I am, but those that do aren't saying a word. All over her Facebook feed, she's desperately trying to reach me because I'm guessing she knows I'm likely looking, but I'm not saying a freaking word to her without my lawyer present. That'll be the next time I share oxygen with her. She's got no way of spinning the narrative to paint me as the bad guy because I've exposed her to everyone who matters to her. And from what a mutual friend who works in the same company as her said, she and POS apparently are being put on administrative leave as of tomorrow. So yeah. Chances are she'll be going into 2021 unemployed. As for the final two binders, well, one's been turned over to my lawyer as my final bit of evidence for my impending divorce, and the last one I put in my storage unit to be burned in Joey's fire pit when the divorce is final. Do I feel guilty about this? No, not even in the slightest. 23 years I did right by this woman. I gave her the home she wanted. I gave her the family she wanted. I gave her the life I felt we both deserved and I loved her unconditionally. Never have I faltered. Never have I strayed. Never have I even entertained the notion of breaking my vows. When an issue came up that I felt was affecting our marriage, I came to her and told her, and we sorted it out the best we could. She opted to find comfort in another man's bed. Rather than come to me and say she was unhappy with our sex life at the time, she decided to step out with a young punk who gave her the tingles. So no, I have no sympathy for what I did, or for her. She can burn for all I care. 
the most I stand to lose is my house, a car, and maybe a couple hundred bucks a month in alimony. But seeing as the divorce is filed under the statute of adultery and New York State is at fault, that might get waived with the insurmountable amount of evidence I've provided. As far as I'm concerned, she's dead to me and I'm never looking back. If you were in such a long-term, lifetime-level relationship, would you have the ability to wait as long as OP did to enact this level of revenge? Or would you just have to call them out on it right away, kick them out, get it going as soon as it happened? Let me know how you would handle something like this in the comments down below. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. If you haven't yet, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. Whatever you do, whether it's liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, all of it helps grow this channel and I appreciate the heck out of it. So until next time, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more stories.